Want to buy a learning management system? Well, there's a guy I know you should talk to first. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Hellman. Now, guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Analysts of the learning technologies market come in many different stripes, but my guest this time stands out for his willingness to ask hard questions of learn tech companies. He's a one-off, a true individual who's fiercely independent and in some people's book, a bit fierce. Kate Fitzgerald, head of fact, tell us about him. Hack facts. Craig Weiss is the CEO of the Craig Weiss Group and founder of findanlms.com. His weekly blog is read in 174 countries. Craig has been identified as the most influential person in the world for learning systems and one of the top three in the world for e-learning. Craig speaks at conferences and events around the world and is recognised by his peers as a thought leader and expert in the e-learning space. A slightly odd thing happened this week on social media. I was identified by somebody as a world expert on learning. Well, I won't bore you with my imposter syndrome. I'm going to take it. So that's this week's episode. Two world experts discussing learning technologies. And what did we talk about, Jay Curtis, Head of Themes? She's on holiday. So, OK, Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact, standing in for Jay Curtis, Head of Themes. What themes did we talk about? Well, John, the great resignation, buyer knowledge, the value of top tens, the state of today's learning systems and exciting developments for the future. So do I get paid double for doing themes as well as the facts? You'd think, wouldn't you? I really enjoyed this conversation with Craig. Not only is he incredibly knowledgeable about the systems on the market, he also has a genuine passion for learning. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how big a feature set a system has or how swish its UI, the important thing in Craig's mind is whether people actually learn anything useful for their lives and careers from it. And it's that passion, I think, that makes some people find him a bit combative. He really cares. So welcome to the podcast, Craig Weiss. It's a great honour to have you on. It really is. That it's such a great opportunity. I didn't want to keep it to myself. I wanted to share it with uh, my friends, my community. So I asked a bunch of people what they would ask if they were in my shoes. I crowdsourced it. It's partly opportunistic. I happen to be at a learning event. Um, So it's crowdsourcing with a pretty small crowd, admittedly, but one that included practitioners, vendors, analysts. Um, So a good little mix there. So let's kick off with a topical one. A couple of people brought this up. Uh, A new study by McKinsey found that 40% of employees will leave their current jobs in the next three to six months. The great resignation, it's being called. So skilling up, reskilling are going to be big. Has the vendor market got the right solutions? to the challenges we can see coming up around skills? Um, You know, John, that's really a good question. And I'm actually gearing up to write about the, it's, you know, also known as the mass exodus and the great resignation. Um, You know, I I think it's twofold. One is overall, um, the systems are not. And that's because overall, when you look at skill capabilities and what I call skills management, the industry as a whole is really at the infant stage and more and more adding it like in 22. And if, you know, skill ratings is, is, isn't even consistent, uh, you know, for these kind of things. I think that when you talk about the great resignation, there's three main themes that come out um, when they've talked to people um, that are leaving the companies and many of them are leaving. They're not going to another job. They're just walking away. Uh, first, they're burnt out. So you have job burnt out. Then the second is um, the company doesn't care about me. They're not invested in me. You hear that a lot. And then the third is when it gets back to the burnt out uh, burnout is that um, this whole kind of thing about mental well-being and wellness. So you have these mm. people, right? You don't care about me. You're not invested in me. 
uh, you uh, I'm burnt out. This is directly related um, as for people that are unaware to COVID-19 um, and the pandemic. And then sort of this, you know, you don't really understand me kind of attitude. And so when you look at two of those points, they're really dealing with third party content. I mean, if they're dealing with personal and professional development. And there have been studies even before COVID that the number one reason people leave companies is lack of personal and professional development. So if you have a system and it's only focused on skills in your job role and has no real kind of capability and assigned learning, right? To me, assigned learning has to walk. It has to go away. And systems, even the LXPs that always said, you know, we're not in a form, they all have assigned learning. So, you know, look, you have to have it for like, I uh, get it, um, uh, compliance and regulatory. But other yeah. than that, you, you know, you, you can have skills. So they take skills, they tie it to the job role. Um, and so, you know, not everybody gets the opportunity to do upskilling. It doesn't work that way. And I find that a lot of blue collar workers and service workers and frontline who have to be on site at any given time anyway, um, I never see anybody going, you know what, as a foreman, I'm going to, you have an opportunity to be in the um, a job role in the office workforce. I never heard of that. I mean, there's, there's limitations and you see that in the systems, you know, you, you see it in the mobile apps, you see it in a variety of other things. So that's number one. And the content has to change. You can't just say everything's about the job role because skills and interests to me are two different things. And there are only a few systems out there that also have that option. So you can pick a skill or you can pick an interest. You know, if I have an interest in um, poetry, why there's content out there. Uh, so why can't I do that? Right. The skill that, and I could learn, I could want to learn a skill. Like, let's say I want to learn Adobe Photoshop. And the system doesn't have a third party marketplace. So they're now telling, and the client buys that, not the end user. And then they give it, mm. oh, I got to go find it. Good luck. Then you have, you know, this lack of, I think you need to have more about personal skills, which the systems do not do overwhelmingly. So let's say I'm in accounting, but I, I want to learn. I have a skill interest in Adobe Photoshop. Mm. Goes to my manager, my manager rejects it. So now I'm unhappy. All right. So I think it's two parts, because at the end of the day, whatever the learning system has content, even though it's a commodity and its courses, by the way, we just use the term content yeah. um, is a necessity. Without that, you don't have a learning system. I mean, you have a file transfer protocol, an FTP. So, you know, I think that systems have to if they're going to be continuing to build the skill capabilities, include the interest. And the, the, here's the I irony is when LXPs first rolled, they really pushed about learner centric, learner centric, learner. That was mm. the whole kind of thing. Interest, interest, interest. They don't mention that anymore. That that's gone because you can't say learner centric. They can say it privately when you're doing assigned learning, that's not the case. And so I think that, look, it's not going to stop somebody from walking out the door and leaving it. But if you're not even trying to um, offer knowledge and, and do it in such a way with the system, the system should be a tool. Hmm. But it has to come back to the person that's running, whether it's L&D or training or whatever. I'm going to focus more on L&D here because they do a lot of the employee side. Um, their background is organizational development. They have to change their modality. Because a system is only as good as the person that's not just the, not the administrator, the person that, that's overseeing the, um, the whatever the content is. And that's where I think there's this misleading statement that, look, the systems have to do more and everything else. It's not stopping me if I'm great at my job and I really, you know, this thing and I really understand what's going on. And, and last thing is I find a lot of people have no idea in the L&D space, in the training space, because HR is seeing this um, and sales, whoever's using the system, that this is even aware. And I just saw actually, you know, you were talking about the McKenzie. I saw a stat for, um, it was in August, and it was this was related to the United States. 4.2 million people left their job. Now, if somebody is not paying attention to this, the systems can do more but they have to intertwine with the third-party content, you know, mm. 
that people have to get more involved with personal skills and, and push that. And, you know, you can have in a system, for example, what's stopping you from putting webinars or live presentations that can be recorded. The system has it built in so you're not just Zoom connecting. Um, mm-hmm. And there's only a couple of systems do this. And you can have like a Pilates instructor, a yoga instructor, whatever to, you know, tap into this. And, and the systems aren't doing that. They're focused all about um, job role related content. So there should be more self-driven learning, more elective learning catered for and that's how you hit the big problem, or that's it, you know system and content together. More, that's how you hit the big problem of people disenchanted with work. Yes, yeah. there should be more. You know, it's um, self-directed learning. There's way too many systems that, and ed tech is like the worst of doing yeah. this. But there are corporate systems that um, have this, you know, kind of syllabus, the synchronous based learning. You go to A to mm. B to C to D. And the power of web-based training is to focus on what I'm interested in, which increases retention synthesis more than you have to learn this skill and tough bejeebies and this kind of thing. And and people don't want to do that anymore. And so when you're dealing with upskilling and reskilling, it's not universal to the workforce. Mm -hmm. I don't believe so. And, And the systems, you know, they skew that way. If they they can say I'm focused on frontline workers and there are plenty of systems that do that, but they don't have the capabilities to say, oh, you know what, uh, right? Because a lot of them are service workers leaving their jobs. They don't have uh, the capabilities today to put in like SIMs and boot camps or whatever. So yes, they need to um, really understand the person rather than just it's a universal um, and I'm focused all about your job role. There were a lot of questions uh, that people had for you. So I'm going to crowbar two in together now, but they are closely related. Uh, number one, what do you think of the current state of buyer knowledge? And number two, related to that, how might organizations become better buyers? Um, I think the current state of learning knowledge is uh, tied into what is happening in society. And I think that there's an overabundance of consumption of content. Again, the way I look at it, John, is that uh, there's pre-COVID and then there's now the real world. And way too many people think this is a blip and we're gonna go back to the way it was, which is not gonna happen. It's not happening in the corporate space, You know, a lot of remote, um, some hybrid. You know, Most companies are pushing back their dates and this all ties back to the knowledge factor. And the knowledge factor ties back into right, the previous question that you asked me. Yep. And um, I think overall, it, it can be better. Um, I think it's become stagnant. I think it's become, uh, again, this ties back to content, no surprise courses, because that's where that knowledge is. There, you know, it, it ties back to the creation of the courses. Um, they're now designed, if you buy a, a system comes with a built-in authoring tool, it's designed for anybody to create it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you have instructional design background uh, and you're forced to use this, this is very limited. I mean, that was the strength of rapid content authoring tools. And if you buy external, it's got templates and everything else. So mm-hmm. it's not structurally sound. And you have people, this gets back to the knowledge okay, um, I don't have an L&D department. I got rid of them. I got rid of training. Or, you know, HRIS is going to take this over. Or I've got a salesperson and you're going to create content. Now, I have no knowledge on effective training or effective design. And I'm being told I have to do this. Well, what are you going to see? You're going to see static. You're going to, what we call just basic, uh, Mm -hmm. maybe some major. It's not engaging. And knowledge has to be, I believe, engaging. You shouldn't be telling somebody, well, just go to YouTube. My God, can you believe people do this um, at a corporate environment? Mm. Uh, And what's the point? So I think learning knowledge has, you know, we've gotten around this micro learning, which has been around since 2000, by the way. This isn't a new concept. Mm. And just thinking that micro means good, which it doesn't mean that. Um, You know, there's kids today, when I say kids, 20-year-olds, 
uh, that believe that will say, and they've done studies on this, that they claim that they, you know, kind of hit the fast forward button on the video and they're learning more, you know, like the mm. old days of the VCR. We yeah, just you can do it that double thing. the speed. Yeah, okay. yeah, double okay. speed. And, and um, I wonder how many people watch these podcasts on YouTube at double speed. You know, slow down, guys. Oh, yeah, that would be, an, you know, a nightmare. But I, I really think the learning is knowledge. When you, when you look at, you know, past centuries, for example, and you look back to the days of where the church were the only learned learned people, right? The, yeah. the rest, the majority, of the, if you weren't, a, um, you know, a higher status or the church, um, you know, you were not a learned person. And then came out the Gutenberg and, every, you know, and then it meant to the masses. And I, you know, when I look at, I've read some stuff about, the uh, enlightenment period of the 1600s and stuff, right? That's, that's where knowledge is. And, and I think that a lot of people today um, in the corporate environment, in the ed tech environment, it's beyond awful. I mean, it's absolutely awful, um, which is why I think a lot of people ripped into the ed tech, you know, with the schools and everything about that and kind of slashed into a learning pretty badly. But I think that when you look at it on the business side, and corporate to me means associations and nonprofits and so forth yeah. is that it, it's just too tailored. Um, it's not really about acquiring knowledge. It's about acquiring the skill to do your job. And to mm. me, that's not the same thing. I want to, I, there are people going to be watching this or listening to this and they're doing it because they want to acquire knowledge. It mm. has nothing to do with their job. You know, you read an, a book, it's, it could be about something you're just curious about. And, and I think people today as a society um, just take fragments, little bits, and then that's it. And they don't want to, you know, expand. You look at Google, right? A lot of people never go past the second page on a search engine. Um, and this all taps this, you know, I say this because this, those are the people that are your learners or your customers. And if they think that way, right, it, it doesn't tap in. And people just sort of live in this echo chamber and mm. they get the feeding of the information as it relates to that echo chamber. And it's this way or the highway. And that is not empowering people. And, and to me, I think that there's, a, for me personally, there's a real concern about AI um, mm. and and, it, you know, especially in systems where people kind of want it like everything automated, um, there's no there's really no more empowerment and knowledge. And for me, that's an absolutely great concern. When I look at people my age, I'm Gen X and um, and I look at some of these, you know, paper, you know, many of us still read a newspaper. I read it online. I read five newspapers a day. Every night, five different, including ones internationally. I read The Guardian, for example. Front to back? Huh? Front to back? Five newspapers yeah, a day? Yeah, front absolutely. To back. Most of them. The Wall Street Journal, I read front to back. But the other ones, the same thing. I focus on articles of interest to me. But um, The Guardian, I read front to back. Matter of fact, I read The Guardian magazine weekly that comes mm. out. And, you know, I read history magazines. And I read them at multiple times, right? So I'll read an article in one and then I'll bounce to another one. I can't read, right? Right. I mean, that's just how my mind works. And I'm a mass consumer, uh, people joke, of, of knowledge. And, and it, So do you think that kind of general information gathering and that sense of, you know, fill, filling in your knowledge very generally in a halo around your work, what you need to do your job, do you think that's the answer to um, organizations becoming answer. better buyers? Yeah, John, you're absolutely right. Look, that's the answer. This gets back to um, you don't care about me. You know, it's just about the job. You have you want a well-rounded person. You know, when you hire people, there are people that can be extremely skilled and qualified, but it comes back to their personality or how they communicate. And you have to work to, with this person. Mm -hmm. And um, you want somebody that's well-rounded. You don't want somebody. I always say to people, if I don't want a robot. I want somebody that can think on their own and, and explore because they're going to have different ideas and different perspectives. And it's based on the general uh, knowledge. So, yes, you want that person uh, uh, to to utilize and, and, and empower them. 
because learning is only as good as you, and I say you being the L&D or training who's ever overseeing this thing, is only as you believing in the empowerment. And it does come from top down. So if your CEO doesn't buy in and just says, look, it's just about the job, then, you know, it trickles. And so I think that's kind of a thing that plays into it. So, Craig, this next question is coming from an analyst. Um, no names, no pack drill, as we say in the UK. You're known for doing top fives, right? Top tens, you know, best LMS, best authoring tool, etc., which is very useful for a lot of people. Uh, as a marketing person, I know from my stats that people will always click on a listicle. But how useful do you think this is as, as an approach, given that in, in learning needs are very diverse? Organizations are very different. They vary a lot from sector to sector, and they all have different needs. As you say, some have external audiences, some have continuing workforces. So if we take a comparison with car, buying a car, Lamborghini might make the best car, and that might be your number one in your right. top five list. But what if your car, you use it for driving to the supermarket and loading up the boot? I mean, Lamborghini is useless for that. It's got a tiny boot. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. This is why I always publish my methodology because I think it's relevant. Um, and I always state like, look, these are the variables I'm looking at. These may not be the ones you're looking at. And so that's why I publish that information rather than just say, here's my list as I'm talking on a blog or when I used to do reports. And I always say, do your own due diligence. This again, is just um, a tool, right? Mm -hmm. You may have never heard of the system. So do your due diligence. I always say, you know, schedule a demo, ask questions. You know, it gets back to people that just shoot out RFPs and it may not be geared to the, right? I mean, this kind of thing. So when I do these lists, um, you know, overall, I'll mention the methodology. I'll say, these are the variables I'm looking at, may not be what you're looking at. And uh, it should be a guide at the end of the day. You're, you're looking at an expert. Um, that studies the entire market. So look, they're going to have, you know, uh, those kind of things. It's impossible for anybody to look at, you know, over 1400 systems, or I think it's about 1385 in the world. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. So you have to base it on cutoff. You have to base it on a variety of factors, but um, yeah, I, I always list, these are the variables I'm looking at, uh, make it very clear and how I wait or like, you know, I might wait this. I look at support. It's crucial um, because it's the number one reason people leave a system, yet people rarely look at it. So, you know, and it gets back to the fee. I look at UI and UX. I look at, you know, certain kind of pieces. But I always say to people, do your due diligence. Um, you know, yes, I know plenty of people click it and they just go off and this is what they base it on. Uh, but uh, it, it's like to me, um, you're, you're tapping into somebody who knows the market, knows that, you know, is an expert or a top, you know, an input, whatever. And that may drive you specifically to that system. And hopefully it's a system that's not even on your radar, mm -hmm. but you still have to ask questions and do due diligence. You can't rely solely on them. And, and again, it, it's sort of bouncing back to look at the variables and you may say, you know what? these aren't relevant to me, or these are three are only relevant to me. And then you can look at the systems and say, okay, these are those kind of things. Um, and that's how I, I see those lists uh, compared to some others that, you know, I've seen the list obviously on the sites, uh, the ones that drive me nuts are the ones that are really affiliate links. So they'll have a top yeah. 10 list and you click on and they're making money, you know? <laughs> so there, mm -hmm. there's an, a thing I'm not making any money. And um, matter of fact, when I do publish a report, which is, a, you know, a top 10 um, in next year, 100% of the proceedings go to some animal shelters that I'm a patron on. So um, I think the independence piece is, is a, a core cornerstone, but, you know, don't just base it, uh, you know, like you said, with a car, you know, you see these car magazines, this is the best car and you're like, well, that's that's not what I'm looking for, but at least you have an idea that, you know, there's something in there. And I think that's the case, even with awards, you have to recognize that may not be a fit. Hey, look at one award, good for it. And, and think of it that way. Mm. So I, I think it's quite a good answer as, as a buyer of, you know, audio equipment, um, a bit of a gear slot nowadays. Um, 
I quite often look at top fives and I may not buy the, the number one, but somewhere in that list, there will be something that, oh yeah, that's the one that does what I need it to do. And because it's in this list, it's it's probably in the top one, so that's useful. I think it's a good point, actually, that a lot of analysts are pay to play. Um, yes, know, there is. And there are, which people don't know, and I, you know, um, yeah. I know, I know who they are um, that do pay for play. I mean, somebody is paying them um, a considerable amount of money. You know, they're not doing it for 100, 100 pounds here. Um, considerable to put them at the top of a list or, you know, to constantly recommend them. Or and to be looked at cool. at all, you know, you you have to pay the price to to actually be looked at by the analyst. You don't come into consideration. Yeah, absolutely. You're you know, I mean, I know some people. They're getting paid like forty grand. Um, that's not cheap. And mm. you're you're if you're paying um, an analyst or an expert, whoever it is, and that's their business model. They're not going to make that public. Uh, and they would be foolish to do that. Um, but there are some vendors that know what's going on. That's number one. And then, but the, the customer, the end user doesn't know, I mean, uh, who's doing that or, you know, what's going on in that case. And at the same time, there's very credible independent analysts that, you know, look, I'll be honest, I have vendor clients, but I don't push them into number one. Matter of fact, EdCast, which was number one for 2021, they're not a client of mine. Um, you know, I have the clients that are hiring me for strategic purposes or pricing, right? These kind of things, but I'm not lead gen for them and I'm not biz development for them. And I would never be. And uh, they are all aware that my rankings or whatever is 100% independent. And they may not agree that, right, that where they, you know, if they're even list, I have clients that are not even on those lists. So, you know, it all comes back to those factors. And, and one of my very good friends uh, over the UK, David Patterson with Learning Light is very, oh, yeah. and it, yeah, I think he's an absolutely brilliant chap. And uh, I have the highest regard for him. I really do, because I, I think he understands the, the industry. And again, very independent and um, really tailors and focuses on, on everybody, whether it's a vendor client or not, but you know, doesn't buy into the, the mantra, which is unfortunate, right, for pay for play. And you see that. And I think for people, when you're looking on a, on a site and you can go to any one of them, you know, if you type in best LMS, these things fly up. You've got mm. the Google AdWords one, right? <laughs> Who's going to, you know, the stick SEO. Yeah. Yeah. SEO, and then you're going to have like these best lists and you click into it and you're like, who's this person, right? You never heard of this person. They've got this list. All you have to do is when you click on it, there'll be a little code up there. Might mm. be, that tells you it's an affiliate. Um, they're getting paid for that. Or they might push ones and it's kind of like they've become an affiliate and you're not seeing that, but it's based on pay-per-click. So, you know, I always, if you're going to do that, at least look and see if this is a person that actually has the knowledge and if they're an expert and they're an analyst and not just like, you know, Fred who writes a blog and, he, you know, he's writing multiple posts and he's listing like top 10 lists and it's, it's a pay for play, just in another modality. The way we work has changed and the way we learn is changing too. But 70% of organizations don't feel that their learning systems can really cope with all this change. It seems there is a disconnect between what learners need right now and what most learning suites provide. In a new white paper, Ben Betts and I tell the story of how this disconnect happened and lay out a vision of what a modern learning system ought to be and do. It's called Sweet Dreams and you can read it now. Episode sponsor Cornerstone, a leader in adaptive HR software solutions, invites you to attend Cornerstone Convergence on November 16th and 17th, with an incredible lineup of speakers focused on helping talent and learning leaders like you to gain the tools to create a better experience for your people. You won't want to miss this all virtual, all free event. Register today at cornerstoneconvergence.com. To what extent do you agree or maybe disagree um, with the view 
I've expressed, uh, I've heard expressed, and this is questions coming from um, a product manager uh, with the view that learning systems have become too general and feature focused. Well, they have to be feature focused. Um, I mean, you know, you're uh, using your car analogy, you're not going to get into a car that doesn't have a radio um, or has now Sirius XM, right? People look to get certain functionality, wireless or is so functionality always drives um, the the aspect. But I think what happens in the industry is it's become when you're looking at again, a lot of people are mentioning LXP, LXPs, hmm. they're becoming very ubiquitous to an LMS, um, which is why I just put that learning system with subcategories and, and it creates confusion. I think as the industry as a whole. There is, I always say, if, if I just looked at every system as a whole, between 80, 80% and 85% have the same functionality. It's, it's mm -hmm. those little variances. And um, I mean, there's a system out there today with their mobile app that you can navigate with your voice. Nobody else is doing that. I mean, they're little clever things. There's, there's systems that have it like you can do a digital signature on the app and um, it automatically pulls it in to the system. So when you're looking at the auditing um, and then there's other systems that don't have that capability, there's systems today that have um, uh, a skill validation, speaking of skills, using yeah. digital coaching and scenarios to the point that it shows the learner a speech in dice, uh, which is great for like role play or salespeople or, you know, whatever. And what it does is uh, one of the words I use all the time, I'm guilty of it is I always use like, like, like it's a you know, word I just use. And um, but it would identify that it would also identify words that I might use that my audience wouldn't understand. And then it gives like it reminds me of readability indices, which will give you sort of yeah. a thing. Like when I was doing my uh, thesis, I remember I used a readability indice. And I remember that it was saying that for a thesis, which is for folks who don't know, is a graduate, a master's degree, that um, it shouldn't be higher than a 12th grade level. And yet you're thinking, well, it should be like, you know, post-college. So, hmm. um, you know, there's those kind of pieces that validate. I think, you know, skill ratings to me is pretty lame because it's a number and there are systems that have, okay, they do that. But then they have like you can put in, OK, this means that, you know, no knowledge and this kind of thing, which I think systems have to do. I would like to I wish systems would come with a preset. Hmm. And then if you want to change it, you can. If you don't, you don't, because actually a lot of people don't change things. So they yeah. just go with whatever's default. Um, the learner hmm. side, look, playlists are hot. So you're seeing them all over the place. I mean, there's. So they do look at the consumer space, hmm. um, but it's not universal. And as a result, you see this sort of very dry and, and, and look. And I believe that, you know, vendors will always mention their clients, big name clients. And I've seen some systems and they'll tell me they're the only system in some big companies. And I think you got to be kidding me. Um, but again, hmm. it's client driven and, 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 this kind of adds to this generality that people will post like Google. Hey, I've got Google. Now the, the, cons the client, the prospect thinks you're, you're the only vendor in Google. That's not what it means. You could be in a department, but they'll never mention that unless you ask them. And so the systems kind of go that route. I think that systems that target employees heavily, um, there is a lot of that generality. I mean, there's like one system has a built-in podcast module. No one else is doing that. Years ago, there was a vendor that came out with an app for a smart TV. Mm. Uh, brilliant, but it bombed, right? <laughs> because it was too yeah. advanced. And, um, you know, so there's, there's attempts. There's systems that, you know, you can scrub the internet and it pulls it back in for free content. It's not universal. Now, the, the, the client doesn't know that most of the times it's coming through a third-party deep integration. I mean, there's mm. one vendor I remember... I'm not going to mention who they are, but they are well known and um, popular. And they say it's their artificial intelligence doing that. No, it's not. It's steep integrations coming in, but it's still kind of a clever aspect mm -hmm. that people utilize. And yet it's not universal. So I think that the UI UX 
Um, there's a misnomer that you have a modern UI UX or you're newer, ergo, you've got the latest features or you're far advanced. And that's totally not true. I know a lot of people knock Cornerstone left and right, Cornerstone learning, not, you know, this, this moniker of traditional. And I've heard this with LMSs. A, a vendor will be like an LMS is traditional. Mm. No, it's not. I mean, it, it comes down, it does come down that functionality. And when I, when I've done a next gen grid, I do one every year and I always post what that qualifies as um, last two years, Cornerstone has been in the, um, in the highest leaders grid. So, you know, I think when a vendor gets it's um, other vendors are doing this. So when a vendor tells the customer, this is, you know, when they're marketing, this is true. It's a stick. It gets attached and a vendor can do whatever they want. And that thing is permanently attached to them. And the only way they can really resolve that is come up with a new brand, you know, rebrand themselves or, or change their messaging. So mm-hmm. I, I would always say to people, look, everybody has a learning path or a curriculum path. Everybody can skin, okay, excluding LinkedIn learning. Um, you know, there's some some kind of things like that. And, but everybody can assign groups or whatever. So mm-hmm. the that's where you kind of come with this generality. But you know, LMSs, I had an LMS in 2002, for example, very unique. It had five levels um, that the learner could kind of, you know, kind of a cool little piece there it was branded on like carpeting and stuff. But it had a mm-hmm. bookstore where I could have people check out content, uh, courses or ebook. you know, we didn't call it ebooks, but, you know, PDFs. It had a chat function. It had a discussion board. It had you know, forums. I mean, it, it literally sizzled and nobody else was doing it. And it, it, in the end, the vendor changed it, right? Because the masses weren't adopting that. And that's where I think um, there has been people that have done creative and unique things, but then they, this is where you get back to the generality for the product manager is that vendors as a whole rely too much on their clients. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, listen to the client, take the feedback, but then you're supposed to be the expert. And I always love this quote from the gentleman that founded Cirque du Soleil. Uh, He always said, if we only listen to our customers, we'd be doing Swan Lake every night. And I think that's a perfect example. I always say to a vendor, if if clients are driving more than 15% of your roadmap, you're not going to be as successful because you have to look, right? I'm buying a system and you're supposed to be the expert. If I'm relying only on the clients, especially there are vendors that will only rely on their 50 biggest clients. Um, and yet they'll, they'll target like 1500 people, but they're focused on 50,000 plus. So, you know, you're going to, this is where you start seeing these problems of vendors going down rabbit holes as a result. And you get into that generality. What have you seen recently in the startup field, perhaps, or maybe from a more established provider that has made you think, wow, this is going to change the way we learn? Um, I've seen a couple of really cool things. I think this, you know, I saw this product which goes into uh, a deep integration. And for the audience that's not aware, a deep integration means it's it's embedded into the system. Mm-hmm. You as the, um, as the client, and the learner, you have no idea that somebody else built this and it's in the system. There's no mentioning that it's, you know, and you're not bouncing to that thing, which is different than an integration. And I, you know, there's a product called uh, Bongo. Um, the website, I think it's like Bongo Learn, because I think if you type in Bongo, you go to a Russian gene site. Um, but anyway, you know, uh, but, it, you know, it's Bongo. And the moment I saw, I actually saw it in the UK last year at LT UK before everything kind of imploded. Oh yeah, yeah. And they didn't have a booth. I just met with them, and, I, and the moment I saw this product, I was like, "This is going to be big," um, because that was that speech and dice thing I was talking about with the digital, yeah. video, you know, coaching. And at the same time, we could be talking. There actually could be the coach could be in a box, 
you know, that, which I thought was very unusual. And they were calling it at one time, like skills assessment. I don't, I've never liked the term assessment scares people. Validation, I think is more applicable, but it had scenarios already built in. It, it truly was the digital coaching experience where people were typically texting. Then the coach responds maybe by audio or I mean by text or by video. Uh, you could do scenarios with it, with your mobile app or whatever. And you know, John, the moment I looked at this, I was like, this is a game changer. And the systems that have already done it overwhelmingly say that people really love it. Once they see it, they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is possible. So I thought that is something really kind of, of clever that what people. Does that add in, so, sorry to interrupt. What, what does that particularly add into the learning experience, that functionality? Say it again. What does that particularly add into the learning experience, sure. that functionality. Well, sure. You know, adult learners believe, uh, you know, number one, what's in it for me? That's yeah. a common requirement. And um, adult learners um, always like real life scenarios, right? Because that's applicable to what's going on okay. every day. And, uh, you know, you putting in like theory, is it going to fly or, you know, the, when you're talking about the content. So I am, you know, you can have real life coach, you know, the, like an expert that you're actually communicating with that can give you advice and mentor you as you're an ongoing employer journey. If you're a customer, this could be an amazing capability on a customer ed side, because now you can tap into an expert that knows not just the product, but they may have knowledge that can really improve you. You know, if I'm an association and I want to create a certification program, I may have a coach that's an expert in how to create certification programs that drive revenue, increase membership, which is why you have a certification program. So, you know, you can help. It's great for onboarding because you have somebody, you know, the way of on the job training uh, is out the window unless it's blue, right? Because they have to be there. If you're doing a hybrid or remote, OJT is out the window. Mm -hmm. So this is a way to provide that empower it. And that person's always available uh, or, you know, whenever they schedule for it. And then the ability for me to see and review myself on the screen and see what I'm doing. If I'm doing, you know, a lot of people use it for um, sales training. Yeah. Uh, and I'm actually able to, if I'm communicating, it should be, you know, if I'm doing customer service, any communication with the general public, this is a great solution because I can actually see how I'm talking or how I'm enunciating and you utilizing the wordage. And then I can also, if I'm not, I can still, if I'm onboarding, you know, the days of, right. How are you onboarding people today? is a lot different than pre-COVID. So um, you have to find different modalities to do this and you're able to tap into something that, you know, it's not where it's just Zoom and you're going to be bored to tears. You're mm -hmm. actually engaged in some type of manner. Again, it's how the client wants to use it. But um, I thought it was very clever. And because of all the, you know, the scenarios is built into it. So it's mm -hmm. not just me communicating with you via webcam. You know, you can also tap in there with people walking around the mobile device. You can actually do a how-to with it, with their mobile right. app, push it into your system for content for people to do these kind of things. So, you know, to me, I thought that was a very clever um, solution. The other kinds of ones I really like is I saw a product and I'm going to, this is kind of an issue in the industry, by the way, is vendors that come up with these names that nobody can enunciate correctly. <laughs> um, so, Tell so me I'm about just it. Yeah, I, you know, I'm just going to help people here quickly. Uh, D O C E B O is pronounced Docebo. Uh, oh, most, yeah, thanks. And yeah, most people say Docebo. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, you know, so there's a vendor out there uh, called Odilo. Odilo, yeah, Odilo. Odilo. Yeah, I even obliterate it. And Wasn't he in saw, Lord of the Rings or something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, a Spanish company. But um, you look at the, the system, it's got. You know, I, the, the, I can't remember what they told me, but it's the largest consumption of digital, lot, you know, content courses from publishers and, and ebooks, and you can download 
the ebook and you know watch it uh, you know read it the audio you know the pot um, not just podcasts like an audio book like audible you can do that on a mobile device which i thought was brilliant because some of them you can only do it on the screen and uh the learners are only able today to do everything on a mobile device they haven't done multi-platform but the administrators can do there and uh i was really impressed i was impressed with the ui ux i was impressed with the amount of content but the other thing i found very interesting was that um, they called it managed services, which it isn't. But it when you buy the platform, you get everything. So you get all that, con- that's all included. Um, the platform, of course, is included. The, the You get a learning coach. That's included for the length of your system, hmm. um, for your agreement. You get this learning facilitator, which helps you, you know, with the learning. You get something called like learning design, which, you know, even they explained it to me, I was confused. But um, you get all these things. And so, it, you know, it's one flat rate. Uh, mm. Now, behind the scenes, it's really from the pricing model. It's called a bundled price model because it's still based on seats. But mm. that being said, you got all these other components included and you got all the courses and content, which, you know, I mentioned is typically you pay this you know, price. It's, it's, it's very expensive. But that being said, I think um, it has enormous potential, especially on the corporate side that uh, you can provide it. And they've played heavy like an ed tech and libraries, which makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. I thought that was very kind of clever. Like I said, I thought the digital signatures that can go in um, into a system and what, but no one has done is said, you know, if you look at Adobe signature or whatever, and once you have your signature, right, you can just drag and drop it or dock your sign or whatever. No one has yeah. done that where it's already created go through. So when I look at the systems themselves, um, you know, th- there's, again, they're picking, there's pieces. There isn't one vendor where, you know, everything you look at is like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Um, I think that there are uh, metric, more l and and training people are getting into advanced metrics and segmentation, which I'm glad yeah. I'm a data fanatic, but, um, and it's needed. And so there are a couple of systems out there like Fuse, um, and EdCast, and even Cross Knowledge that have really extensive analytics. I mean, it, it, as a matter of fact, EdCast and um, Fuse are not, yeah, Fuse, it's a BI tool, a business intelligence tool that's been deeply integrated. You don't pay mm-hmm. extra for it, and you can just slice and dice to your heart's content. And um, to me, I would like to see more of those. And what many vendors are doing is they're, they're, they have basic analytics. I'll use Docebo as a perfect example. So when you buy the platform, you see these analytics, data visualization isn't there. I mean, it doesn't wow your eyeballs. The data you're getting is pretty basic. Um, some of it, I would even, you know, how uh, excessive it is. But then you can buy an add-on, which is actually in the system. They just turn it on. Um, that's universal analytics. So it's more advanced. And that's what is a trend that's starting to happen. Absorb has the same thing. Now, I'd rather see the basic analytic get booted and you just, you know, throw this in and go through to that. So I think that there isn't necessarily like that older low, they have a thing called learning experience built in authoring tool. It looks like it came from 1999. I even mentioned it to them. I don't think they were enthralled by that. But um, yeah, I think, you know, when you look at, I'll, I'll say one system. I think has done an incredible job, but they focus only on technical skills. So if it's not technical skills, you're not buying this system. Mm. And that's plural site. It's an absolutely wonderful system, but it's all technical skills and they have the experts and every other kind of thing. And it looks like, you know, a Bentley, if you were like walking again, I do often tie um, learning systems to car analogy because they are that way, you know, cars and is a, a big investment. So it was a learning system, right? There's a lot of variable test drive. Do, and so, you know, when I looked at it, uh, yeah, this is like a Bentley. Uh, well, Bentley is going to be far more expensive than, you know, a Kia or a Hyundai or something else, but it's all technical skill related. And now they have a certification kind of piece tied in that's really strong. The analytics are very impressive. And so if I was somebody that's like, look, I'm only interested in technical skills for my IT staff. I'm not interested in anything else or my company only does this. Then I would seriously look at Pluralsight, but it's not cheap. 
And I think that when you look at a system, at the end of the day, um, it comes down to your budget. If you can't afford it, you can't buy it. Uh, and so there are, I think, way too many people that want all these amazing things and they can't afford the system. And they, you know, it kind of reminds me of somebody that comes up with a job description. I'm sure you've seen these descriptions and you mm -hmm. look at him and you're like, who is that Superman? Right. There's that person doesn't exist yeah. and they don't lower the expectations. And then they get upset, right? Because they can't find that person. And I think that's the same way with people with, with solutions where they, they have to temper down reality of they're not going to get everything because they can't afford it. And, um, and that's why I think you see this kind of uh, variance with the systems. But I don't think excluding plural site, I mean, EdCast is totally kind of thing. Fuse kind of goes with a community angle, which is very unique, that everything is wrapped around. Um, you know, there are systems that do that, but they're not obviously it gets back to the variables of, of what you really need. But like I said, I thought the bongo thing was absolutely brilliant. Um, even Anders Pink's content curation thing, I think, is brilliant. Good old um, Anders Pink. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, Stephen's And have you read Stephen Walsh's book of short yeah. stories? Yeah. So he's Obviously. a friend of mine. Well, I know him well. And yeah. uh, a great company. He's a great guy. Uh, sorry, people. I'm kind of We've had him on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, of course. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was, uh, I think it's still a great solution. Hmm. Um, and, uh, but again, it comes down to the vendor. It's really a, you know, the vendor to doing a deep integration and now that kind of works. Yeah. Thanks. You've given us, a, a, I think, a great rundown and idea of what's going on in, in the vendor market. And you're, you're clearly very close to these things. You look at them a lot. Um, it, it's been really interesting. Uh, I tried to get in as many questions as I could from my crowdsourcing effort. Actually, you answered a lot of them without me having to ask the question as well. So um, well done. It's been a bit of a, an easy ride for me. And a very pleasurable one. Um, and I'd like to really thank you for coming on the podcast, Craig. Well, thank you so much, John, for having me. And I had an absolutely, the questions were great. And I had an absolutely uh, great time. So thank you. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to Craig and to our sponsors, Learning Pool and Cornerstone. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. If you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. Great Minds on Learning has been on a mid-season break, so apologies if you were expecting a new episode last Monday. The next episode, The Moralists, is out next week. Then the Monday after that, we'll have Megan Torrance on The Learning Hack. Till next time. Stay curious, learning people. Now I finally get it.